it's mood lighting. Um, hi everyone, welcome, uh, good evening. Um, hope you're staying warm and uh, in warm company. So welcome to the, uh, what is this? The second uh, Herbal Balan Lectures uh, in the series in uh, the fall of 2023. So I'm very excited um, to uh, welcome you to this function. For those of you who are new, this is Taipei Cooper, and this is uh, part of Cooper Union, uh, postgraduate certificate program in typeface design, but also more than that, uh, workshops in typography, information design, graphic design. It's a really wonderful thing. Lots of, lots of graduates are in the room, so shout out to them. Um, the lecture series is part of the educational uh, module within the uh, extended program. So we have usually 12 lectures per year. Um, this is the second in the series in the fall. There'll be a spring lecture series and there will also be a summer. Uh, we'll have um, more talks coming up, um, but first I uh, wanted to give a huge uh, shout out and, and a big thank you to Type Culture for letting us record um, and archive this talk and all of the previous lectures that we've had. Um, we have a very extensive archive, thanks to them. Um, if you go to the, either of these two links, you'll see the past lectures, and you can see the, the lectures in there. It's about eight years of lectures um, going back. Type of Cooper started in 2010, but we have recorded lectures back that far, so there's about 80 lectures. So if you like this topic, there's more, more lectures in store for, for, for you to see. Um, we do have two more talks coming up. Um, both are going to be remote, um, but if you go to the link in the, in the previous slide, uh, coopertype.org slash lectures, you'll see the information for these two talks. Um, Dr. Jill Gage is going to be um, presenting on November 13th, on uh, Monday 13th um, at 1230. It's a lunchtime talk, Eastern time. It'll be on Zoom, webinar, and live streaming to YouTube. Um, this is the title of our talk, is the type 500 years of fooling the reader. And the lecture <clears throat> closing out the fall will be by Alexei Chekhov um, describing the Ukrainian, the history of Ukrainian uh, Cyrillic typography. So wonderful artist, wonderful designer, and, and also a pretty knowledgeable scholar of the history of Ukrainian letter form. So sign up for that. Um, they're always free, uh, so it's kind of a great, great asset. So. Um, you can find that information at that link. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to introduce today's talk um, in the series, and I'm very glad that we have um, this lecture happening tonight. I'm very, very excited to hear it. Uh, uh, Marek Nedelka um, is a Brooklyn-based uh, graphic designer. He's an award-winning designer from the Czech Republic. Uh, he is trained in architecture and graphic design. Uh, and his practice mostly engages with the printed and digital branding projects within architecture, uh, graphic design, culture in general. Uh, he lectures and gives workshops uh, widely. In late 2019, he founded Letterbooks, um, a small publishing imprint focusing on language, writing systems, and typography to get a deeper impression in the reading of letters from unexpected directions. The book, um, the first book uh, that was published um, by Letter Books is National Letters, which is the topic of today's talk, amongst a few other things, but the copies of that book is here as well. The book traces episodes of the past in which letters, languages, and scripts played an important role in creating states and national identities. Please welcome Mark. All right, thanks for joining us here. Thanks for Sasha, uh, thanks Sasha for having me here and good to see all the familiar faces, also the new faces. Um, let me start with uh, introducing the letter books, which is the publishing imprint. And as Sasha mentioned, focusing on language, script, and typography. Um, National Letters is a first project and it's kind of like a first chapter of the long, long-term long research project. And the second one uh, was Imagining Letters, which was a 
which was a talk uh, for uh, University of in Lyon, and we just published recently with uh, Aneshka, my wife, Mysterious Letters, and I have both books here if you're interested. And so the first project which I will be talking about tonight, and the reason why I'm here, is the Nation Letters. It all started as a my master thesis at the Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague. And later it turned into anthology uh, published in 19, uh, 2019. Uh, National Letters travels through the not so recent history in which letters, languages, and scripts played important role in creating nation states and national identities. And the main body of the book explores four case studies, uh, Turkey, Israel, Georgia, and Ethiopia, each using their own unique script. And the book is divided with these analog photos, uh, which introduces the, each country visually. And we took the photos together with my friend and colleague, Jan Novak, uh, on our, during our research trips to, to each country. And uh, they kind of captures, they capture the typographic landscapes of, of each country. So we are focusing on the uh, road signs and all the lettering and typography found on the streets of cities and countryside. And these sections are followed by a short introduction written by myself. And but the main body of each of every chapter is uh, our essays written by experts in given countries. In this example of Georgia, the essay is written by a linguist, Rusadana Amerji Bimulan, a Georgian American a linguist. And also the Turkish chapter is translated for the first time from French and is written by Emmanuel Shurek and Birol Chaimas. Uh, the chapter about Israel is written by William Safran and Ethiopian by Professor uh, Budil. And before I start talking about national, national letters, I wanted to talk a little bit about the imagining others and mysterious letters. So the following project, uh, was a lecture titled Imagining Clutters, Languages and Script as Emancipatory Tools. And it's kind of a sequel to Nation Letters, uh, which took a step forward and focused on the modern history of the invention of writing systems as emancipatory tools for indigenous nations, for eliminating, eliminating of disadvantages or creating universal languages in connection with technology and ideological motivations. As I said, I was presented online uh, for Enz Balion students, and it's found, it can be found online on YouTube. And I feel like this project is not finished yet. I would like to continue working on it in the form of a workshop, maybe, and develop it and turn it into the, the reader, like the, the other two projects. These are a few images from the lecture. And the last one, the, the newest one, is Mysterious Letters. And it's a book about the Voynich Manuscript, but the Voynich Manuscript is kind of like a MacGuffin. So uh, all conversations with Czech and US scientists in different fields that con uh, are part of the book always starts with Voynich Manuscript, but we end up talking about uh, different topics such as technology, science, language again, and deciphering. It's like a private investigation to the unsolved mysteries surrounding the Voynich Manuscript. Uh, it is considered a UFO of a book world, and it was written in an unknown language and script in an unknown location uh, in, the 19th, in the 15th century. These are a few images from the book. So the f it starts with the essay by Aneshka, uh, who compares the, the book to Alien in a very poetic way. It is followed by essay by a uh, mysteriologist from Czech Republic. 
as illustrations by Anushka, and some interviews with linguists and computer scientists. Yeah, we'll have a book lounge in a very cute and cozy space, Molasses Books, in Bushwick, so you're all invited to be there and, yeah, listen to how we uh, develop the book and have some drinks afterwards. Tuesday, November 28th, 8 p.m. Okay, so uh, uh, now we turn the page and go to the nation letters. So let me start by explaining how I came to the topic and uh, the necessary terms for understanding the, the book itself. How do languages work as nation building tools? Uh, first of all, let me demonstrate to you how languages and writing systems shape our view of the world and how languages and scripts uh, are used as political tools as almost everything else. On uh, one example from my homeland, I was born in 1992 in a Czech and Slovak Federative Republic, which was just two years old at the time, and the country later split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia in 1993, so a year later. So technically I was born in a country that no longer exists. Uh, I never thought about it before, but it, when I started thinking about it and uh, being here in the US and traveling around the world, I kind of, yeah, gave me a different perspective on viewing my own country. And uh, in, nine, in 2018, while working on this book, my country celebrated the 100th year anniversary of the establishment of Czechoslovakia, uh, a common state of two nations. And I never realized, realized before uh, that my own country was based on a literal fantasy of one man, philosopher and the first Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Garek Masaryk, who had a dream of an independent Czech state uh, a chapter of one of his important books, or pamphlets, is in a national letters and provides an introduction to the mind and rhetoric of a central European politician in power 100 years ago. Uh, so between nine, uh, the years 1914 and 1918, Masaryk traveled around the world to meet and persuade Western politicians to accept his proposal of a completely new state of Czechs and Slovaks. And it's worth mentioning that Czechoslovakia was based on Masaryk's conceptual construct of ethnic Czechoslovakism, which joined the Czech and Slovak speaking population into the eight and a half million national majority, over 3.5 million German speakers, and the other small minorities, which put together accounted about for about a third of overall population. So he made up his fantasy of common ethnic Czechoslovakism just to outvote German minority. Um, because Czech and Slovaks didn't have very much in common before, and they just understood each other because Slovak and Czech are not far from, uh, yeah, they, they basically dialects uh, of each other. And these linguistic similarities between Czech and Slovak languages gave Masaryk the argument, uh, plat argumentation platform to push his idea into reality. And for the context, it was all happening right after the uh, end of World War I, World War II, uh, first, when victorious uh, allied powers allowed the smaller European nations to fulfill their cultural and political struggle for self-determination. And dismantling the old system of multilingual and multinational empires along the linguistic fault lines. And how do written languages work as nation building tools? Uh, so now we turn the page uh, to answer why particularly their written forms are so important in building nations. A Canadian philosopher, Marshall McLuhan, writes in his Gutenberg Galaxy, it is important nowadays to understand why there cannot be nationalism where there has not first been experience of vernacular in printed form. And the following quote by Benedict Anderson, the invention of printing press established in fixed written languages and their forms, typography, and through this helped to build the image of its own antiquity. This is where we begin to observe a sense of the imagined community uh, 
called a nation, people who think, speak, and read the same language, as uh, Benedict Anderson coined. It may well be that print and nationalism are axiological or coordinate, simply because through print and pe print, a people sees itself for the first time. The vernacular in appearing in high visual definition affords a glimpse of social unity, coextensive with vernacular boundaries. And more people have experienced this visual unity of their native tongue via the newspaper than through the book. So this statement suggests that the emergence of print media, particularly newspapers, has had a profound impact of, on fostering nationalism and a sense of social unity by visually representing and affirming the existence and importance of the vernacular language within the particular community or nation. So this leads us to the most important question. Why do some nations have their own writing systems? So the previous quotes sparked my curiosity about the, the non-Latin writing systems, their development and their histories. Because according to Prussian philosopher Wilhelm von Humboldt, the diversity of languages is not diversity of signs and sounds, but the diversity of views of the world. So exploring different writing systems can help us understand our own, our own landscape. And in my research, I focused on the intentional, centrally controlled nation building of the 18th to 20th centuries, intertwined with the development of communication, technologies, and networks. I wanted to include these beautiful maps by Gottfried Hensel from the 18th century to kind of visualize how diverse fighting systems were and still are around the world. So to answer my previous question, there are two main reasons why some nations have their own writing system. So first reason is cultural identity and heritage. A unique writing system can serve as a symbol of nation's cultural identity and heritage. It allows a country to express its distinct linguistic and cultural traditions. Developing and preserving a writing system can help reinforce a sense of national pride and promote the preservation of local languages and cultural practices. And writing systems and languages were usually recorded and maintained by churches in the form of religious text and through this way survived centuries as time capsules long before the nation states were formed and before the invention of the printing press. Uh, Georgian, Hebrew, Ethiopian scripts, all of them modernized and adopted new versions, but also, but also shows how rich the literary and artistic traditions were uh, in these regions, uh, imagined communities are. So then when the printing press was invented, or better say, introduced to Europe, capitalism and created regional book markets that had started to form nations, people speaking and now also reading in the same languages, which all later in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries led to creation of nation states along linguistic fault lines. And finally, the modernity and emerging communication technology of nation states Telegraph, newspaper, etc., helped to reinforce the visual standardization into one national language or script transmitted by the central power. And then finally, the central power looked to reinforce the authority long back to history and the old artifacts in the form of these old religious books with the first records of the scripts. It leads us to the second factor accurate language representation, which is that creating a writing system specific to language enables efficient representation and communication of the language. It allows for accurate recording of spoken words, facilitating the transmission of knowledge, literature, history, and ideas within a community, ensuring integrity and clarity. And this dual development of spoken and written forms of languages and the ability of writing system to update itself helped to create a world with different writing systems. For instance, while the Latin alphabet 
may have been considered in many parts of the world due to its simplicity. It will be much more challenging for a country as linguistically diverse as China, for example, to choose just one dialect to represent in writing. Instead, indigenous script allows for a variety of spoken forms while maintaining consistency in written form, or the case of Hangul in South Korea. So now we can enter the second part of this presentation, which are the case studies, the main body of the book itself. There are four, four case studies in the book that examine the topic of national letters or scripts from different perspectives. Although there are other nations or states with their own writing uh, national script, such as, such as those on the slide, I decided to select four case studies to sufficiently cover the spectrum of the topics related to uh, typography and writing systems. So one reason for selecting just four is that I wanted to travel to these regions and document the typographic landscapes in order to find and document in interesting stories behind the national writing systems. And before jumping into the first case study, I would like to recommend this incredibly captivating book uh, which was published last year called Kingdom of Characters by Professor of East Asian Languages and Literatures, Jing Su. It explores the stories that helped China modernize uh, its language and writing, increase literacy and adopt technologies. And I promised we would leave the homogeneous world of the Latin script, but before doing so, we should definitely stop off in a country where Latin script itself, unlike anywhere else in the world, maybe Vietnam is the only exception, exception is perceived as a national symbol, which is Turkey, our first case study. Uh, it will help us to understand how crucially written languages operate as a tool for the formation of nations and nation states. The subtitle of this chapter, uh, or the case study stands, one simple step, one small step for Atta, but one giant leap for Turk, which is the obvious paraphrasing, paraphrase of astronaut Neil, Neil Armstrong, and it implies the enormous social, socio-cultural shock, which is almost unimaginable today, experienced by Turkey more than 70 years ago. A change in the writing system from Arabic to Latin. Uh, President Atatürk's motives were as much political as they were linguistic. The attempt to separate the state from the influence of the church or the religion, national unification, and in addition uh, to the reforms, a clear movement towards the modern West and its culture. To give you full context, uh, Turkey succeeded the ethnically heterogeneous Ottoman Empire, and the response to unification was a need to deal with minorities which dis disrupted the impression of Turkey's ethnic and national homogeneity. This is of course, this of course had tragic consequences for the Kurdish and Armenian minorities living in the east of the country who were driven away and killed and the Greek minority on the west coast. And this is one of the huge downsides and flaws of nationalism. And I think the ethnic majority wants to control the territory give an impression of homogeneity and then and they decide to suppress minorities. It happened many times in history and it's still happening today. Um, another goal of the typographic reform, of course, was increasing the literacy of the population. One convincing argument for typographic reform was the difficulty in typesetting Arabic. Although Arabic is a phonemic language, the script is not based on individual signs, which could be arranged easily for print, rather it's a cursive script. So Arabic writing is highly calligraphic with ligatures, which makes it difficult to kern and connect characters. And also individual letters uh, change based on their position within the word. So one letter might need up to four uh, variations, the initial, medial, final, or the isolate. And setting the script requires a great deal of inventiveness and is disproportionately exp more expensive to manipulate. So since the invention of the printing press, the Latin alphabet had a considerable advantage over other script types. 
Setting a Turkish text for printing in, in Latin needs hundreds of type metals fewer than a printer using an Arabic script. So for it's, it's like 29 signs in the Latin alphabet, but f uh, 482 in Arabic. Uh, the standard Latin alphabet was complemented by seven further symbols, chushu, ju'i, u, a, u, which are precise phonetic representations of phonemes particular to Turkish. The Turkish Language Association, Türk Dil Kurumu, presided over Atatürk himself, also to great care to ensure it along with the typographic revolution. The language also rid itself of most of the terms taken from, the, from Persian, from Arabic and Greek, and replacing them with neologism and surrogates. And neologism, neologism invented by Atatürk's language engineers could not replace deeply rooted words. As an argument to keep these words, the obscure Austrian linguist Hermann Fyodor Kvercic presented his son language theory on the premise that Turkish was the first language ever to be created. According to his theory, the very first word anyone uttered was A. Ah. Upon looking up the, at the sun, following this line of reasoning, all of the words taken from Arabic and Persian were at the bottom Turkish. And one of the most fascinating aspects of the typographic reform were marches to promote and celebrate the gi giant typographic leap of the nation. And streets were filled with posters presenting the, the Latin alphabet to the public. Uh, the poster on the, on the left says, the schools of the nation will open on the day. Anyone between 16 and 40 who does not know the new alphabet is obligated to attend. Even neon light installations was prepared for the celebration, showcasing the simple uh, letters of the alphabet. I wanted to include this amazing reportage uh, from National Geographic from 1922, taken in Turkey. Yeah, I don't know which other state in modern history have done such a transition and reform, which is at the same time well documented in photographs and texts. At the end of the, their new courses, citizens were given a diploma showing that they could read and write in, in a Turkish letter. And it's seen on the right. And the most striking aspect is, uh, of this typographic revolution was the speed with which the change took place. For printed dailies, the transition to Latin script was set for a precise date in late November, seven months after the change was announced. And during our visit of the, to the archives of Atatürk's library in Istanbul, we observed, observed how uh, the Cumhuriyet newspaper changed its writing system from one day to the next. And interesting footnote is that Kazakhstan uh, another state with an ethnically Turkic population has initiated a similar typographic revolution. And they are planning to officially switch from Cyrillic to Latin uh, by 2029 to distance themselves from Russia. And all these radical state reforms took place in the modernist period. So it's not surprising that the construction of a new center of power the new capital city, Ankara, was included among them to demonstrate how the ambitions of the new republic. Ankara represented tabula rasa in which a new Turkish order could be constructed. Moving the state headquarters to a medieval city from the time of the Hittites, located in the center of an Italian plain, was mostly strategic uh, because Atatürk, with a long military career behind him, they don't want to be attacked on the sea, which could easily happen in Constantinople or Istanbul. So Ankara allowed Atatürk to construct a unified national narrative arising from the ancient roots of Anatolian culture and the multi-layered port known variously as Istanbul, Constantinople uh, or Tsarigrad, 
could not offer such a consistent narrative. And the typographic revolution and the new city are both the most tangible and visual representations of the state's ambition to go west. Um, our record of typographic landscape were centered in Ankara. Uh, it was mostly previously known as a city f uh, for breeding Angora cats and it is now capital of Turkey with almost 5 million residents. And every, dis every building display at least has one flag, uh, red with crescent and star. And the President Erdogan's speeches blast out from every television. And despite a lack of continual historical development in writing and its typographic tradition, as these photos show, shows, uh, the Turkish uh, typographic revolution serves as a striking reminder of the power of deliberate language reform to shape and redefine a nation's linguistic destiny. And while a Turkish case study demonstrates the ideological movement of geographically eastern countries towards the West, the second case study demonstrates how Western thought on state building was geographically imported to a place with different priorities and how ignoring these differences created problems that appear practically irresolvable uh, now more than ever before. Uh, we move to Middle East, to the territory of present day Israel. In the story of Zionism and the modern, modern settlement in Palestine, uh, language and writing have their own chapter. A unified language and writing system were absolute necessities for building a state at the turn of the 20th century. Although it seems today that Hebrew was always the clear choice, this was not the case. Hebrew is something of a modern linguistic miracle, a language conserved mainly in writing, chiefly in religious texts, became born again as a spoken language in a secular script. That's why the subtitle for this chapter stands, a new language sweeps clean, but an old script knows the corners. Uh, Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionist movement, didn't believe Hebrew could be the language of the future Jewish state. He was not interested in the romantic resuscitation of the Hebrew or the reincarnation of the historical Hebrew farmer, like the Zionist of Eastern Europe. He believed the state's official language should be German, as he noted in his diary in June 1895. I believe German will be the main language. This conclusion arises from our most widespread jargon, Judeo German. This will rid ourselves of the language of the ghetto, once the secret language of prisoners. Our teachers will realize this. Um, in, 1899, uh, in 1898, during Herzl's only visit to Palestine, he encountered Eliezer Ben Yehuda, then a young linguist, but later a key figure in the revival of spoken Hebrew. He noted, I also met a young fanatic who tried to convince me that our movement needs to adopt Hebrew as our national language. This is, of course, laughable. And the first Zionists were cosmopolitan people with command of a number of languages. They all knew the benefits and simplicity of Latin script, but even so, they opted to keep the Hebrew abjad. As the British linguist Jeffrey Sampson noted, Traditional Hebrew script could be described as a fairly clumsy system. Its adoption by the founders of a highly developed nation who were all acquainted with the other scripts has to be explained with a view to emotional considerations relating to history and religion. In the linguistics of both spoken and written language, these irrational factors play a much greater role than practical use. Its heaviness and the fact that written Hebrew was unchanged since the beginning of the printing press in the late, in the 15th century, led British researcher, researcher uh, Hugh J. Shenfield to revise it following the example of Latin script. He published his proposal in 1932 in a slim volume and a specimen, the new Hebrew typography. This was precisely four years later of the publication of Jan Chichold's The New Typography, 
which offered new approaches to working with LatinScript. He suggests change, changes, including the creation of italics, distinguishing lower and uppercase letters, creating serifs, and reverse contrast of horizontal and vertical strokes, in a sense, bringing Hebrew type as close to Latin as possible. He argued that since they were, there was a revival in the spoken form of the language, this should also be reflected in a change of a script. And he said, he wrote in the specimen, it is true indeed that the Hebrew language has burst the bonds of the traditional spirit. It is not yet, for, it is not yet free. For Hebrew is still in bondage to the letter. Those age-old characters in which the sacred scrolls have been penned so patiently and exactly by generations of scribers still shackle it with the, their metallic counterparts. And there was another attempt at reformation of the written form of the Hebrew, and it was through Latin script itself. One key supporter was the son of Eliezer ben Yehuda, the founder of modern Hebrew, Itamar ben Avi, who published a weekly called Dedor, in English, Liberty, in 1930s. And it was written in, a, in Latin script. Uh, although his, although his uh, project was not successful, Ben Avi's system for the romanization of Hebrew is still used today on traffic signs throughout Israel. And interesting fact is that the Itamar Ben Avi was also the first person in over 2,000 years who, uh, for whom Hebrew was a mother tongue. It is also not without interest that uh, Ben Avi probably met Atatürk, then still Mustafa Kemal, twice uh, in one of the hotels in Jerusalem. And while Ben Avi's attempt to romanize Hebrew was uh, were unsuccessful, Atatürk succeeded in romanizing Turkish only a few, years, a few years later. And it was uh, Ben Avi, or so he claims in his uh, biography, who gave the Turkish statement this idea. And just as it did for Turkish nationhood, building cities and settlements played a key role. In both cases, we are dealing with a mix of pragmatism and modernist symbolism. The biggest city to become a manifesto for Zionism and modernity is Tel Aviv. This first modern Jewish city bordering the city, Arab city of Jaffa, built on sand dunes on the coast of Mediterranean uh, from 1909, is the Israel state central narrative. Uh, and Tel Aviv is perhaps the only city in the world whose name came from a book, as Sharon Rothbard writes in her book, White City, Black City. And she says, it may not be a coincidence, coincidence that Tel Aviv was the first book at first a book and only at later a city. After all, Zionism made two main goals were the revival of Hebrew language and the building of the land of Israel. And in that respect, Tel Aviv is a full-size realization of Herzl's oxymoron, and which stands as a living proof that books can erect buildings and establish cities, because cities are the material pillars of the nation and their street layers through their national identity symbols onto them. Language, letters, typography, the so-called typographic landscape. And in the case study of Israel, the revival of Hebrew is considered an exceptional linguistic phenomenon. This revival brought an ancient language of books to modern spoken form, Ivrit, through imagination and concerned, uh, concentrated efforts of individuals, educators, and linguistic pioneers. And while the previous two case studies showed how the, in the case of Turkey, the type was used as a political tool into, to incite a civilizational leap and the change in the country's geopolitical orientation, in the case of Israel, writing a language worked as a social adhesive, which allowed arrivals from new countries to feel a sense of togetherness in their new home in this third case study of Georgia, writing worked as an ancient shield, thanks to which the Georgians maintained their statehood 
despite constant pressure and turbulence in the region. That's all the reason why the subtitle of this chapter stands Caucasian type now unavailable in all families, kind of paraphrasing a commercial language of contemporary type foundries. Uh, the Caucasus, a belt of land between Black and Caspian seas, is one of the most ethnically and linguistically atomized regions in the world. Historically, this territory is also very unstable, determined by the various affinities to the superpowers which demarcate the region. In the north, Russia, formerly the Soviet Union. In the south, Turkey, formerly the Ottoman Empire. And Iran, formerly Persia. And the headline for the story in the next paragraphs could be Soviet Acrobat Reader. It was the Soviet Union who meddled most intensely in writing systems, perhaps of all the governments of the world. Legislative acrobatics were employed constantly as the linguist, as a political language and writing of various minority uh, nations transformed until the entire charade ended in a decision which was politically convenient for Moscow. The Bolshevik Revolution, which ended the rule of Tsarist monarchy in Russia, opened the doors for the emancipation of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. During the revolution, these nations used this historical opportunity for nation, uh, national self-determination and established their own states, later fluidly uh, forming larger formations, similarly as in Central Europe, uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, so these states in the Caucasus and Central Asia usually had very short lifespan, terminated very soon after the consolidation of the power at the center, again in Moscow. Examples of these states for, from between 1917 and 1920, uh, 22, 1920 include the North Caucasus Emirate, the, Republic, the Motion Republic of the North Caucasus, and the Kars Republic. And during the first years of the Soviet Union, there was still a conviction that the Marxist revolution would spread throughout the entire world. When Leon Trotsky was still in power, he predicted that Western Europe, with its Latin script, would become the center of the new Marxist state. After the death of Lenin, who enforced the urbanization of peripheral territories, the Georgian Joseph Stalin, originally commissioner for national issues, seized power. Then the global situation changed considerably and not in the Soviet Union's favor. The Marxist revolution did not spread west and diplomatic isolation forced Stalin to completely change his strategy, leading Moscow to what could be called one state, one country socialism. As World War II grew closer, Stalin turned to nationalism, the only movement capable of mobilizing such an enormous territory in case of war. Hence the uh, Soviet linguist, linguistic engineers began to reinstate Cyrillic, casting aside a new Latin, uh, Latin script. The second, no less important reason for this step was the recent establishment of Latin script in Ataturk's Turkey in 1928. Stalin was afraid that the Turkic, Turkic nations of the uh, Soviet Union might grow closer to strong unified Turkey, uh, as Nicholas Ostler writes in his, in his book. Uh, these last two, Armenia and Georgia, are unique examples of small states with a national writing system of their own. Of the 15 countries that formed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Armenia and Georgia proved the most resistant to Russification. While for most of the ethnicities of the Caucasus, type was a 20th century invention, Armenian and Greek, uh, Armenian and Georgian already had their own alphabet established following the example of Greek and dating back to the uh, fifth century AD. The first written record of this alphabet, whose outer and precise date of creation remain unknown, come from the year 430 AD, 
specifically in inscription in the church in the present day Palestine. Uh, this inscription, however, has nothing in common with the contemporary form of the civic Georgian alphabet known as Khedruli. This inscription was written in, in a type called Asantavruli or a capital letter. When we speak of the Georgian alphabet, we mean three different forms of writing. Asantavruli, Nushkuri, and Mkhedruli. The first two are usually are used only rarely by the Georgia, uh, Georgian Orthodox Church. Mkhedruli, as mentioned, is the official script of Georgia. It is written from left to right and is composed of 33 characters. Mkhedruli indicates stress, but it uses no diacritic marks or capital letters. An interesting fact of the Georgian language uh, and its writing is that it's, it does not distinguish genders and is also read, read exactly as it, as it is written, which I think of English or French is certainly not a matter of course. Um, in 2015, UNESCO have even added Georgian scripts, all of all these three, to the intangible cultural heritage list. Uh, the creation of these unique national writing systems is closely tied to the national churches. At the beginning of the 4th century AD, the Kingdom of Armenia became the first nation to adopt Christianity as its official religion. The Georgian Orthodox Church became the official church of Georgia shortly after. The failure of the Russification in these two countries can thus mostly be attributed to a historically deeply rooted religion and culture mediated through a unique writing system. A Jewish-Russian poet, Asif Mandelstam, once very nicely said of Georgian culture, I would consider Georgian culture as a type of ornamental culture, tracing the outlines of the vast and fully developed territory of the foreign culture. They, meaning the Germ Georgians, mainly absorb only its outer, outer design while at the same time fiercely resisting the internally hostile essence of the powerful neighboring territories. The presence of ornament in the Georgian alphabet is undisputed. The entire expressive character of, this, of the alphabet is based on distinctive arches above or below the baseline. This character allows for highly visual and expressive work with the script as attested by, uh, to, by a number of graphic works and book covers from the modernist and futurist periods. At the beginning of the 20th century, the entire world was obsessed with desire for progress, for destruction of the old and for renewal. These tendencies were reflected in art and culture as indivisible components of the life of society. The creation of an independent Georgian Republic based in Tbilisi attracted, uh, attracted artists and whole groups of the Russian avant-garde from Moscow. One of the movements to pump through this, the city was futurism, a path to the rejected aged approach, approaches and which wanted to establish a new language of art. Futurist books from the 20, 1920s became one of the crucial events in the cultural scene of Georgian metropolis. And during our visit to Tbilisi, which became the center of our explorations of the Georgian typographic landscape, we noticed in addition to signs saying 2424, to emphasize that the opening hours truly are all hours, and the omnipresent signs advertising Sedorok's book and translation, we noticed one important element that fascinated us throughout the trip. Since 2013, it has become compulsory in the capital to display all shop signs for international companies in Georgian script, as well as the, as the original. So walking through the streets, you can thus observe Georgian imitations of H&M, McDonald's, Under Armour, Puma Makita, etc. And the intimately, the intimately familiar epigraphic of these global brands through a simple substitution of the shapes we know so well feels like a surreal alternate reality somewhere in the Caucasus mountains. What you'll barely see, however, are science and Cyrillic script. Although Georgia was indelibly a part of the Soviet Union, the Union could never suppress the historic relationship of the Georgians to the writing system, especially not here at the very heart of the Georgian nation. 
animosity towards Russia was only heightened during the war for South Ossetia in 2008, and type is thus a symbolic, intentional organi organic demonstration of control over one's own territory and the viability of Georgia's national type and its typographic landscape. In the last case study, we move even further away from Central Europe. While Georgia is considered the place where civilization first tested, first tested wine, inland Ethiopia is where people first roasted and drank coffee. The name comes from a province in Western Ethiopia called Kaffa. According to legend, the mountain shepherds noticed that after eating the orange berries from the omnipresent bushes, their goats were considerably more active than before. They tried roasting them, grinding them, and mixing them with water. And they created coffee, one of, the, one of modern Ethiopia's most important exports. Ethiopia, located in the Horn of Africa, and one of the largest African countries, is interesting in that almost everything is considered national, uh, civilizational. From the plant known as teff, a local gluten-free grain, which is the foundation of Ethiopian cuisine, through khat, the local chewing drug, which has similar effects to coca leaves in Latin America, in South America, and which the locals use, among other things, could, uh, to counteract the adverse effects of the extremely high altitude in the capital of Addis Ababa. To the absence of surnames and their own Orthodox Julian calendar, which is seven years behind our Georgian calendar, and the unique system of time measurement in which the new days begin at six in the morning. But what qualifies Ethiopia to become one of our case studies in the book is the fact that it is one of a few or maybe one of two African countries to use its own national and indigenous scripts until this day. It is also one of the two African states on the continent never to be colonized by European superpower. Of course, except a short episode between uh, 1935 and 41, when Ethiopia was attacked and occupied by fascist Italy and after which the Emperor Haile Selassie was forced to leave to exile in Palestine and Great Britain. I felt compelled, uh, compelled to explore how these two facts, the national script and never to be colonized, are connected. I will give you an immediate answer. Uh, first of all, the country's ability to maintain its independence and avoid colonization contributed to the preservation of its indigenous writing system and cultural traditions. Second, the Ethiopia's lack of colonization allowed the country to maintain greater control over its culture and educational systems. Unlike many colonized countries, Ethiopia did not experience the impo imposition of foreign language as the primary medium of instruction or administration. The GS script continued to be used for writing Amharic, the official language, as well as other Ethiopian languages, reinforcing the country's cultural autonomy and linguistic diversity. But going back to, uh, to the roots, similarly to Israel and Georgia, Ethiopia uses a character system whose development and standardization are closely linked with religion. In Ethiopia, this is the very influential Orthodox church known as uh, Toweedo, founded in fourth century AD. The first written records using Ethiopian type, however, are from the fifth century before Christ. The, liter the liturgical script from those times is still used in the church today, known as Ge'ez. The modern Ethiopian official language, Amharic, is recorded today using a reform script called Fidel, which means literally writing system. This is the central administrative script used by all bureaus and schools. It is written from left to right and belongs among the syllabic sign systems, abugida. The characters are graphemes representing syllables, syllables and consonants and the vowel e. 
Define the 33 basic characters, which are then slightly modified by short complementary strokes, called flex, depending on the appendant vowels. The whole character set, known as Fidel Gebete, is composed of 299 characters. Even in the digital era, the form of the graphemes are, has preserved a certain ancient and calligraphic look. When in Addis Abeba trying to find out anything you can about local typography, you won't get far. Everything connected to Fidel is referred to as calligraphy. Even though Ethiopia is a multi-ethnic state in which around eight languages are spoken, belonging to three families, Semitic, Cushitic, and nilo saharan Amharic is the most, is the dominant national language. This is paradoxical because the Amharic people form only 23% of the population. The largest ethnic group is the Oromo, 34%. The Oromo people, however, never participated in the rule of the state. The current Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, elected in 2018, is the very first Prime Minister in the history of the country to come from the Oromo. Historically, the Oromo language was written using both Fidel and Latin script. This was true until the 1970s when Mengistu's brutal dictatorship prohibited the use of written Oromo completely. In 1991, the opposition movement OLF, Oromo Liberation Front, decided that Oromo would be transcribed using a version of Latin script known as QB, as they consider Amharic an imperial language. The only official language and lingua franca of Ethiopia, however, remains Amharic, written in Fidel. Just as in the previous case studies, the capital city, Addis Ababa, is a center of power and wealth from which power is then bureaucratically distributed to the peripheral regions. Here we can see a beautiful photo of Addis Ababa from 1897. In the case of Ethiopia, we cannot speak of a perfect nation state. The tribally administrated southern regions can hardly be described as entirely integrated components of the state. The same could be said of the Somali region in the east of the country where control over the territory is still uh, assured as there is a uh, sizable Muslim minority and obviously Tigray region in the north of the borders with Eritrea. In many respects, Ethiopia's linguistics are reminiscent of China's, where someone from the west of the country finds it hard to communicate with someone from the east. Only a common administrative writing system establishes a shared platform connecting diverse regions into a single state. Another connection between Ethiopia or, and China, or Thailand and Japan, is the tradition of preceding empires and their projection of themselves as an entire civilizations rather than state as, states as, as such. I don't mention China by chance. In recent years, we have observed the materialization of enormous Chinese investments in Ethiopian infrastructure. The monumental Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Nile River, roads, connections to the East Coast, East Coast in Djibouti, a newly opened light rail system, and entire districts of high-rise buildings in the south of Addis Ababa marks the great interest that China has in the region. After his election in 2018, Abiy Ahmed, the newly elected the reformist prime minister, further opened up the country towards the east. Ethiopia has a fast, uh, fast growing economy, now slowed down by ethnic conflicts in many parts of the country, and some Western media already consider Ethiopia both positively and negatively the China of Africa. Now let me summarize the last case study with a paragraphs from the essay by Professor Budil, published in National Letters. Room for Ethiopia to move up in the international political and economic order was extremely limited. For instance, pre-major Japan was predisposed to rapid modernization by high levels of uh, urbanization, literacy, homegrown mercantilism, relative peace internally, efficient and centralized government, and ethnic and cultural homogeneity, which simplified the processes. Traditional Ethiopia lacked all these attributes. 
However, the survival of Fidel, despite its additional economic costs, may be taken as one of the signs of Afro-modernity as coined by an American political scientist, Michael Hunchart. And in, in conclusion, the GS script not only maintains a strong connection of Ethiopia's ancient roots, but also serves as a vital tool for contemporary communication and intellectual exchange. This phenomenon is not unique to Ethiopia, as we see similar examples in countries like Japan, Thailand, and South Korea. These nations recognize the significance of preserving their indigenous writing systems alongside embracing the changing landscape of modernity and glo globalization. The Gea script as a cultural symbol reminds us that embracing both tradition and progress can coexist, allowing societies to forge a path that respects uh, their past while embracing the opportunities of the present and the future. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. If you guys have questions, let's use this mic so that the folks watching on live stream can hear. So, and Mark, do you want to say anything about the the books? As mm -hmm. well? You want to mention the books or remind people about the books? Yeah. There are also books. Uh, so if you're interested, <laughs> you can <laughs> come closer and take a look. Yeah, it's just and, wait, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first off, just incredible research. Um, you know, really amazing. Just taking us through this kind of journey. Um, just, just out of curiosity, if there was any plans for what to do for like a fourth publication for letter books. Um, you know, what's you're covering next? If the, anything that you'd be comfortable to share, of course. Yeah, uh, good question because uh, I was actually thinking about extending nation letters because there is interesting example of Morocco uh, who kind of um, made the Tifinagh, the oldest existing script of Africa to become an official language and script. So this is really interesting and very different from all the case studies. And yeah, definitely developing the imaging letters into something more tangible because it was just a presentation and talk and there's so many, so many things to, to develop further. I was thinking about actually yesterday when preparing for this talk to turn it into a spreadsheet to kind of open the, like a, to have an open resourced um, page to collect all the all the sources and then maybe print it and definitely like technology uh, that's really interesting like how technology shapes maybe something Sasha is interested in too how technology shapes typography and the forms so yeah this may be the next maybe in future in two years or so. Okay. Hi, um, over here, yep. hello. Uh, you should totally do the spreadsheet idea just because I wanna look at it and I think everyone here wants to look at it. Um, but speaking of technology, I'm really curious, you know how in the Dutch tradition of making letters, we talk about the broad nib pen as a tool to make letters. Um, in Ethiopia and in Georgia, uh, what were the tools that were primarily used to give letters their form? I'm just really curious. If they were what? The, the last uh, use, oh. the last, last sentence? Oh, I'm, I'm really curious about what tools were used in Ethiopia and Georgia um, that gave letters their form. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, sorry, one more, one more time. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So, um, like, you know how when we talk about Latin letter forms, mm -hmm. it comes from the Dutch tradition of using the broad nib pen, right? Yeah. Um, so in Ethiopia and in Georgia, um, is there, like, an equivalent of the broad nib pen? Yeah, it's probably the Tbilisi in Georgia and Addis Ababa in Ethiopia are, like, the, the capitals, and everything was kind of distributed from this, from this one one capital, so the whole, like, yeah, the entire culture behind the typography was, has started there and developed through their 
just from very few places. So, uh, was it like a brush or was yeah, it? Like, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, 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 sorry, thank sorry. You, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they were like using brushes. First, again, they, they all started with Bibles, writing it, and mm. then kind of translating it into printed form, and then, yeah, simplifying it in a similar way as Latin script oh, wow. or any other script that's uh, spread in the world. Okay, thank you. Um, what were the most surprising similarities and differences among all the scripts and letters that you found? And following up on that, do you have a personally favorite letter that to you was so unique that you just found pleasure in its individual history? I would say, like, of all the letters in the world, in any, al any, al any alphabet. <laughs> yeah, I really like Czech Z which is not anywhere else in any alphabet. It's like completely made up letter, very difficult to say, to pronounce uh, to anyone who's not Czech. So, yeah, it's like a big test for everyone. And the second, the first one was the differences and similarities. Like a visual form of it. Yeah, I would say the, because, yeah, Turkish is Latin, adjusted, and Israel and the Hebrew and Georgian are also alphabets. And I was, I really like how the Abu Gida of Ethiopia looked, how com completely differently it is formed. You have these, like, simple shapes, and you're kind of adding these flags into it, and... Yeah, this was really interesting to see like how completely differently the letter forms are formed. Yeah. Yeah, is that a good answer? <laughs> Hi, um, I really um, am interested in this subject for a long time and thank you for making it, uh, compile all the research in a book. Um, I, my question is, how do you like organize and contact or even like curate it and ask these um, linguistics and um, people that's written in, and you, you mentioned you translated some of them. So how do you contact uh, the scholars and what's the process of you getting through this language barrier and make, make, uh, put all, include all their articles in the book? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, some of the texts in the book are commissioned for the book itself. It's like a new, the new things. So the Ethiopian chapter was kind of advised to me to add by the, the author of the first text in the book called Power Letters. And I'm really glad I included it into the book. And yeah, there was a second one, which I have first translated from French using Google Translator. And then, yeah, I got a research grant from Academy of Arts to kind of get a perfect uh, French to English translation and finally was able to read it fully. And um, yeah, because there was also the English summary as part of a English, uh, the French translation, so I was able to understand what the subject was about. And some of the texts are just reused from linguistic article, uh, linguistic articles, journals, and yeah, so I read it like a couple times, then left it for a couple months, and when they were able to speak to me again after f several months, I was I knew they are ready to be part of a book, so giving this time and this like short break and gap between these. Yeah, it kind of made me include these texts into the book. Thank you. 
And it's also one of the reasons why I, I feel maybe the for Imagine and Clutters to be to have this open source spreadsheet would be even more helpful to open for people to add their own interesting articles and yeah, notes and links to images and websites. Yeah. Because it's really hard to find some time to focus on research while doing the normal design work during the day. <laughs> so it's exhausting. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's rewarding too. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi, Merrick. <laughs> Thank Hi, you Nick. so much for that. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us about the, the slides that you have separating each each of the four locations, like uh, their commissions from other designers that then became postcards for the printed book, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm, yep. I'm curious about the commission and what you asked for and also what the cards say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can go back to, to show these. <laughs> yeah, this is one of them by Anishka, my wife, sitting there. Uh, yeah, it was just a quick idea to kind of, because the book is a white cover, and white jacket, so it's a really boring book. And when there's no sunlight, like, casting on it. So I decided to edit these postcards, in a way. So there are four postcards uh, complementing the book. So I commissioned my friends, my, my closest friends, so Aneshka, Jan Novak, who was also part of my research trip, Jan Horčík, they're both Czech type designers. Uh, one of them runs All Caps Type Foundry, the second one Heavyweight Type Foundry, maybe you know them. And the Turkish one was probably the first use of ROM by Seth McLaughlin, uh, which is now distributed, published by Dynamo. So yeah, I just wanted to edit these nice touches, yeah. Thanks for the question. Anything else? Care anything on YouTube? No. no. Come and take a look at the books and buy a book. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>